No worries. Um, so we've got uh, quite a few folks in the room um, today. And so much like the last session, what we'll do is we'll probably take comments from the room first and then um, go to the folks online. Um, Evelyn and I are here in the room, so we'll help facilitate that process. Um, and so without further ado, I'm just going to get into a couple of um, quick introductions and housekeeping items, and then we'll get started. Um, so I am Kelly Murphy. I'm the Assistant City Manager, and this is Evelyn Prim. She's our Communications Coordinator. Um, the purposes of the meeting tonight, this is our third and final public input session for this engagement. Um, and what we're looking to do is uh, gauge public interest around recreation in Montpelier. Um, so this process mimics the process that was done for um, the Country Club Road site um, and the actionable master plan. Um, and so what we're looking to do is get feedback on recreation in Montpelier, whether it's at that site or within the existing site. Um, and so Alan Becker is gonna take it away. He's with our um, consulting group, Power Wellness. Um, there's also a... Um, sheet circulating right now. If you just write your name and contact information down, that would be great, just that we can keep track of who is here. And then um, for folks that can't join us for these public input sessions, we do have this information in survey form on the website. Um, at the close of the meeting, Evelyn will give a quick um, tutorial of where to find that. So I'm going to have Alan take it away from here. Thank you. When you're running the PowerPoint, great. <laughs> Um, I wanted to thank everyone who's attending both in person and virtually today. Um, we had the uh, pleasure of visiting Montpelier last month um, and getting to be uh, tours of the city, tours of your existing recreation facilities inside and outside, visiting the Country Club roadside um, site. And the purpose of our visit and the purpose of the study we're doing now is really to see whether um, the community wants us to pursue a feasibility study. So this isn't a feasibility study because that would require more time, but it's really kind of an introduction to see does doing a study like that make sense? Um, what should the study include? And um, what is the community's interest in a new recreation and wellness center? And what does the community want to see offered there in terms of services and amenities? Um, so if we can move on, we basically have, um, this is our third meeting. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, there is an on-site online uh, survey that everybody can take. And what we'd like to do in this meeting uh, if we can, and we realize we only have an hour, is to um, ask some questions, get your reaction. Uh, please feel free to be honest with us um, and to tell us what you're thinking and what you think should be included. Um, so we're going to try to, as I mentioned, we have a lot of questions. We're going to try to get through these uh, quickly. Um, our first question uh, revolves around the issue of how does the Montpelier community define recreation and wellness? What does that mean to, to you as citizens and residents of the uh, city? And so this is the first question. If, is there anybody in the room that wants to provide feedback? If not, we'll take the questions online. So um, what what does this mean to to you? Um, uh, we have some people online. I'm not sure I can see them. They're all muted. I'm right up here to the table. That would be awesome. I'll say Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Pam Pasberg. Uh, I'm a um, a citizen member of Montpelier. Um, and I would define, I, I am a pickleball player currently at the Montpelier Rec. And um, to define it for from my point of view from and from what I'm seeing, last month we averaged 500 
pickleball players at the Montpelier Rec. Wow. There were not, that's not 500 different people, but 500 people signed in last month to play pickleball. Uh, that was Monday through Friday. So um, there were also three, and I got this information from Heidi Aris, who is the manager of the Montpelier Rec. Last month, there were three over 360 basketball players that signed in to play basketball Monday through Thursday during the noon noon recreation or noon slot. On the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, we don't have a number, but they play ping pong and they play dodgeball at the rec on Sundays. So to me, uh, the recreation center on the Berry Street is affordable recreation for many. And when I say recreation, uh, fitness and wellness works into that because most of that is definitely some cardio um, fitness as well as um, fun. Okay, that's all. Great input. It's amazing how po how popular pickleball has become, and for good reason. Um, anybody else want to offer kind of a definition of recreation and wellness for the community? We've got someone else here in the room stepping up. Hi again, I'm Nolan Carver. I'm just here at the microphone to speak my mind once again. Um, I just observed an awesome hike through Hubbard Park. Uh, I was noticing the signs indicating the change in dog leash policy. I happen to be looking forward to that change. Um, and I was just wanted to say, um, you know, I like finding that strike, you know, between the city, the suburban, and the Appalachian mountain country. And I just wanted to say also that I've been struggling with accessibility over the years due to anxiety and economic concerns. I'll give you an example. I would show up at the, at the basketball in the rec center, and I wouldn't have any money to go inside, wondering what I should do. Um, Another example, I'll go inside and I'll play basketball, uh, but um, they didn't like my, my style. They wanted to play hardball. So you see, um, I'm being marginalized one way or another. Um, so I'm just looking for that social opportunity that I've uh, mentioned in the past. Um, we have to get out of these isolation zones um, we have to have something that's social and accessible and um, really a place that's uh, civilized, honestly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that input. I could give it a shot. I'm online. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so my name is Kevin Q. Um, I've actually been a, a resident in Montpelier for geez, about 20, 25 years now. Um, grew up playing basketball at the rec center um, every day at noon. Um, yeah, during the summer, I'd play at noon. During the school year, they'd always have open gym between um, you know five and seven, seven and nine. Um, just to build off the last two um, people who came up and commented about you know, accessibility, welcoming community, just, you know, I always felt welcome when I came into the rec. It was a great place for me to go as a young teenager. Um, I could show up there after school with all my buddies, you know, have a good couple of hours, go home and do it all again the next day. Oh, sorry. I got my kid in the background. Um, okay. And as a, oh, one second. Sorry about that. Um, Probably. but I noticed that as I, as I got older, um, it was harder to find a place to play recreational basketball, um, outside of the rec center. Um, you know, when I was, when I was younger, Sundays, we'd go to the high school Saturdays, we'd go to the middle school. Um, and then the rest of those days were either filled at the rec field itself or at the rec, um, facility on Barry street. Um, and, and, you know, I, I mentioned the basketball scene quite a bit because that's kind of where I'm at. 
Um, but I play with 20 to 30 guys on the regular. Um, and it's not in Montpelier often. I have to go to Waterbury. I have to go to Northfield. Um, I'm in a couple of local leagues, uh, Revolution and the Central Vermont Men's Basketball League. Um, I feel like if we had a, a bigger facility in Montpelier, it would definitely drive a lot of opportunities uh, for more tournaments to come in, less travel time for locals, um, and just an overall just a, a building community um, like it was when when I was younger. Um, and I, I took the survey. I don't mean to, to take over. I know five minutes for a question. Um, but like I, I go up to Berlin to use the pool up at Green Mountain Fitness. Um, I'm sure an indoor pool in the wintertime would drive – um, a bunch of traffic. Um, and, and, and I know I like to swim in the winter, so not in the cold outside, but you know, I indoor facilities are nice. Right. Um, and then, you know, dog parks, I know there's been the, 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 the ongoing discussion about Hubbard park. I go to Hubbard park four or five times a week. Um, so I just think overall it'd be a great, it'd be great to build out our recreation and wellness, um, and bring it back into Montpelier like it used to be. Is there a dog park in Montpelier? I don't recall seeing one. No. So I go, uh, I, I walk, I, my dog actually passed two weeks ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, I know to, that was, that was a word vomit. Um, but I usually take her to Hubbard park quite a bit. There's, there's miles and miles of trail or we go to Vins, you know, Vins allows you to walk around and stuff like that. So. Um, an actual true dog park in Montpelier, um, I think would, would help the community, especially with people who just go to Hubbard park to walk and they don't want to, um, they don't want to be kind of have a dog come up to them without their leash. And I know there's a lot of people who don't like to have their dogs on leashes because, um, dogs have more fun that way. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Um, should we move on to, uh, do we have any more input on this question or should we move on to the next one? We have one more person coming up here. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Steve Cease. I live on North Street and I've either worked and or lived in Montpelier for over 50 years at this point. In that time, I think I've walked, biked, skied, run, paddled uh, in a great deal of the, of the uh, capital city. But I want to come back to a, a point that I think uh, Pam Passberg started. And it seems to me if we're talking about a recreation center in particular, wellness and recreation start with kids. And I want to um, focus on that aspect of, of recreation in the city because we're really talking here tonight about a recreation center. And I think our prime audience for that should be the kids in town, kids who can walk to a recreation center after school or on the weekends and engage in healthy, socialized recreation in a safe, affordable venue. So that's what I'm going to come back to that, I hope, in remarks later on. But I wanted to make that point now as we start out. Thanks. Thank you. Oops. Jesus. And, and so our second question, a little bit different topic. Um, and I and I realize this is very general because we all have different net definite, definite definitions of what wellness is. But where do you learn about wellness today? Who provides that information in the community? Do you get it online? Do you get it from news sources, from the hospital, from physicians? And do you think this is something that the community should be providing? Any thoughts on this? Do we have anyone in the audience? We do. Someone's coming up right now. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm really loving this meeting. Um, I think about this question all day long. I'm a psychiatric survivor, mentally ill. I have two psychiatric survivor resources um, that are maybe two or three. One of them's uh, a formal conventional model, and we have a lot of great affirmations and great employees. It's not perfect, um, but it's safe and colorful and functional and clean. 
Another one is more improvised and not entirely safe or clean, uh, but it's very humane nonetheless, although these places are very quirky. Um, 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 my point is that um, I think of in terms of psychiatric well-being sort of like how can i access that like that socialization how can i get that food and that uh community around the community meals also known as soup kitchens uh, we used to have several of them in this town we have uh, one daily at one specific location uh these meals are becoming more and more popular with a homeless pandemic uh, the quality of of my life has 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 been 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 challenged by the flood, which has removed these churches, et cetera. Uh, so um, that's where I'm coming from as far as how can I meet my basic needs for socialization, some nourishment, some civility around that table means everything to me. Uh, but it, like I say, we're full of chalk elbow to elbow of quirky people. It can. It's very stressful in there. I've had to have a legal prosecution just to feel safe in that place. Um, so thank you, Alan. Thank you for asking that question. Well, thank you for your thoughts. Um, what other kinds of... Um, I mean, do people see that there is a need for a physical location for wellness services? Or did, is that an overlap with recreation or is it an, a kind of an output from recreation? Uh, Steve Whitaker. Hi, Steve. I think that, uh... Wellness is self-defined and that recreation is more culturally or academically defined. So there's a lot of folks that I believe are, you know, joining or creating bike clubs or running clubs or Frisbee golf or whatever. It, it There's various recreational activities that are uh, inspired by just creating community and creating collegiality. Whereas wellness is, I think, far afield from our infrastructure discussion. Uh, they're related, but they're not, I don't think the city government uh, needs to have a role in defining people's wellness track. Um, I think everyone needs support in defining their own wellness track, but I don't think that's a role. I, I think we got more basic essential needs for city government than uh, intruding into people's wellness prescriptions. I think that's a really good point. I like what you said. Um, wellness is kind of an outgrowth of the opportunity we create with recreation. And um, I think that's really, um, that that's good input, good guidance. Looks like Thank we you. Have um, online. Uh, Marna, you, you can have those that speak now. Yes, I agree in part with the last speaker. I don't expect wellness information from city government. I expect wellness information from many other sources. I expect city government to provide responses so people can partake in their own wellness by creating recreational opportunities and the, the thing like the feasibility person mentioned, but I do not expect the information uh, to come from the city. Thank you. Thank you. Are we ready to, oh, okay. And so we're on question three. Um, what do you expect from a recreation and wellness center? If the city were to, let's say, build a new one or remodel the existing one. Uh, perfect. We have someone here in the room. Great. Uh, I'm Todd Olson. Um, so we moved here uh, 
about 25 years ago, and uh, I'm an avid tennis player. At the time, we had uh, four indoor courts at uh, First and Fitness, and um, you know, it became sort of one of the centers of community for me there. I, I um, some of our first friends were my tennis friends, and they're still some of my best friends today. Uh, we're about to lose our last indoor tennis court uh, in Montpelier, <clears throat> which means that the closest indoor tennis courts are probably about a 40 to 45 minute drive away. Um, and I think it's a huge loss. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in the suburbs of New York, which obviously have a, you know, it's a bigger population center, but uh, we had really um, vital uh, junior tennis programs at a couple of indoor uh, tennis centers. I spent uh, many hours during the day when I could have been uh, out on the streets doing uh, doing much worse things than playing tennis. Um, and, you know, there again, it was a source of, of both recreation and community for me as a kid. Um, and it's something we don't have here now. Um, and I think <clears throat> Wendy Watson, who's a, um, you know, coach tennis for a while here can speak um, a little more to how much of a loss that is. So we, when we were there, there was a, ten, the, the tennis court at Green Mountain announced they were closing or something. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Wendy Watson. I've um, lived in Montpelier since 1997. Hi, um, Wendy. Hi there. Um, I'm an avid tennis player in the community and a USTA player. And also I've coached the Montpelier high school team for 18 years, retired now. Um, but that was a big part of community wellness being part of the um, kids, the young adults in the community, um, growing a program from just growing a program. Um, so yes, Green Mountain Community Fitness, We it, it, it used to be first in fitness. They had four courts. They went down to... Uh, two courts, one of which was pickleball and then one of which was tennis. Um, Nick, the owner, um, has just announced last week that um, this will be the last winter of indoor tennis in central Vermont. And July 1st, there will be no longer any indoor tennis. Um, and so I think it's a huge, it, it's, it's hard for the tennis players because we have nowhere to go in the community and it's not realistic to drive 45 minutes to an hour to travel to play. And it's a huge piece of our community um, for the adults. But I also wanted to speak to just what it means for the high schools. The high schools have really developed. Um, the high school tennis teams have really developed. We've had state championships. There's, you know, Spalding, there's U32, there's Montpelier, there's, and, Winter in Vermont is tough for part of the training in spring. We would, I would have them shovel holes in the snow for training because we have to get on the courts. So in order for us to have any time to hit balls before our first match, we need indoor courts for, for the coaches to work with them. And I think it's going to be a huge loss um, if we don't get the indoor courts. I would like to see the land up at the um, country club road have some sort of tennis barn with at least two courts in it um, to facilitate both the community but also for the high school kids in particular um, and then at some point i hope someone will speak i'm an avid paddle tennis platform tennis player too and i travel to burlington once or twice a week in the winter. And that's a huge sport that is very community based and social and wellness. And it's, it's an amazing sport. And eventually I would love to see some platform tennis, just two with a little clubhouse up at the country club road. And I'm sure other people might speak to that. Um, but I think it's imperative we get indoor racket sports. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I think we have Phil, and then we'll take more comments from the room. Okay. Good 
Can you hear me now? Yes, Phil. Okay. Um, my expectations would be twofold. One, the location, and two, the cost. Um, I watched some of the earlier presentations, and I agree with, there were comments by Dave Kidney and Christine Lilliquist and Jessa Bernard about keeping it downtown, keeping it accessible for kids so that they can go after school easily. I think Country Club is a, is a long way off, and so my, my under, preference would be to rehab the existing space. Um, I think, I understand there's a grant that's going to be upgrading the energy system there, um, but I suspect overall rehabbing that building would be a lot less than building a new one. We did have a study last December. A consultant came in and talked about a couple of versions of a center, one with a pool, one without. The one without would, would cost uh, $44 million by one uh, calculation by a council member. Um, we're a city in a bit of a fiscal bind now because of the flood. We have a lot of big needs, roads, water pipes, housing, and, and maybe even a new high school. Um, our municipal taxes are probably already the highest or next to highest in the state. And our school taxes are going up as a result of changes in the, the education finance law. So I, I question even whether a big bond, like even if it's 30 million would, would pass in Montpelier, not to mention the debt policy we have, which limits how much we can, we can borrow. Um, I look back at a 2019 survey that the city did on, on, recreation, it said only 25% uh, of people in the city would pay 250 to $350 more a year in property taxes. So I think there are limits to what you can expect uh, taxpayers to pay for here. Uh, and, and the consultant last December said even the, the smaller center would require an annual fee of, of uh, 450 per adult or 700 per family. That might be more than what some people can afford and certainly goes against the desire for accessibility. Um, I'm, I'm just hearing about the tennis concerns and I'm uh, sympathetic to that. I understood at the first meeting, uh, Nat Winthrop was here to discuss a proposal by the hub group, which has been around for a while, but said they're about to make a new proposal to the city. And my understanding is that would be a tennis and pickleball and maybe paddle tennis facility uh, but more privately um, run or at least built. So I, I, I'm perfectly open to that. Um, but I guess I would not be in favor of going forward with a feasibility study to look at building a new big structure, a new replacement rec center um, up at Country Club. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, we have other people in the room that are on their way up. Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is uh, Darian uh, McElwain, and I would like to build uh, on uh, what Wendy talked about. Um, just to talk a little bit about me, I've been here for about 35 years. Um, I was out of the country with my daughter, and we came back in uh, 2017, and um, I didn't know anybody. I had gone through a breakup. I was kind of in the woods. And I started playing tennis again at First and Fitness. And back then, there were USTA, there were uh, old people, young people. There was an amazing kids program where kids from, um, you know, young, young kids from elementary schools. Then there were, uh, there were high school kids from both Spalding and from Montpelier and from U32 all playing together. We had uh, a woman who was a, a, played up until she was 100 years old and she was a darn good player and we had all that and we lost it. We, we talk about having one court, but that court is not accessible to any of the kids uh, around here because it's after, after basically after as soon as school is ended around four o'clock it becomes a soccer field or a, a, a soccer a soccer place. Um, and so within, since First and Fitness is no more and we have one court, which is only open sort of during the day, 
We have lost two teams for Spalding. We've lost both uh, the boys team and the girls team. Uh, the boys team at U32 is also struggling to um, stay. Uh, the girls team is struggling. Montpelier under uh, Wendy's coaching took championship after championship after championship. That also happened with JP. Now it doesn't happen. And I also want to talk about the the kids, they don't have any place to play. And the consequences of that is a little scary. My daughter played for Montpelier a couple of years ago. And the only place for her to play, for any of those kids to play, was at the Bridges down in um, south of uh, Waitsfield, kind of down by Warren, I believe. And, um, you know, the kids would be driving icy roads. We're talking about, you know, 15, 16, 17-year-old kids driving down by themselves. And I was terrified, you know, for my daughter. My daughter was scared. Uh, they'd go in snowstorms. And, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to name individuals, but one of our best players was driving down, hit ice, um, hit the guardrail, went over. I believe she had two other girls in the car with her. Everything was okay, but it could have been really bad. Um, and yeah, everybody's struggling right now. Just like Wendy said, the kids have absolutely no practice until until the season starts and uh we're talking about wellness um you know people being together old people young people uh boys girls men and women and we really really need a winter uh tennis program um it's a lifelong sport and um we need it here in central vermont and right now we have nothing and everybody's scrambling about what we're going to do for the next year Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more speakers on this or do we want to? Oh, yes. I see someone coming Again. to the table. We've been um, talking about one uh, recreational activity, tennis, which is a terrific sport. But I think we ought to back up a little bit and take a little bit wider um, focus on what we're talking about from a recreation and wellness center singular. A wellness center or a recreation center can be a number of things. People talk about cross-country ski centers, but they're really all about dispersed recreation. For me, I think um, we need to get back to that, our, our ideas about who is our audience, who's our target market, what are we trying to do with a recreation and wellness center. I said earlier that I think a prime focus in the city ought to be for the kids in the city. And my theme here would be keep the kids downtown where we really want them, where kids on the streets after school or on weekends create a real sense of vitality and community. They don't have to drive to a remote, well, remote, a distant location on the outskirts of town with a kind of a painful drive at times. Tennis is a great sport. And um, I think that getting back to the, the um, Elks property, the country club property, it seems to me that property is best suited for dispersed recreation. We already have walking, running, dog walking, skiing, a, a disc golf center. And it seems to me that the, rec the uh, Elks property is best suited for those forms of recreation. If people are interested in a private, privately funded tennis facility on city land, that's great. And I, I would probably be supportive with the understanding that if it's on city property, perhaps um, people less able to afford play time, court time would be able to play um, and so on. But as an idea, it's a great idea. Getting, coming back to issues about a municipal recreation center, we also have to remember that the city is basically broke and how we would afford a multi-million dollar rec center at the country club property is really beyond me. Bill Dodd mentioned earlier um, some of the problems facing the city crumbling infrastructure, a, a really serious problem with the unhoused folks in the city. We are, and the possibility of a, another devastating flood, which could occur at almost any time. So I really think in some respects, we need to remember that maybe recreation isn't the top priority for the city. And we really need to keep our ideas focused and affordable. And with that, maybe I'll be back, maybe not. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we got one more person in the room and then we'll go back to Marna online. Oh, okay. 
Actually, we have quite a few more in the room, which is awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Kristen Cantu, and I live on Foster Street. Uh, when I think about a recreation center, I, I definitely appreciate the gentleman's perspective on, let's start with the kids, but I don't want to forget about the adults as well. <laughs> um, I have a young child, so I definitely want kids programming, but I think uh, we need robust programming for all ages. You know, the Surgeon General had a report on how there's a loneliness epidemic, and as people have talked about already in this group, about the benefits of coming together as a group, and I think that would do a lot for our community. Um, to have this sort of programming for all ages. I want it to be affordable to everyone, and I also want it to be accessible. Um, you know, the benefits of having something downtown, you know, making it walkable is great. I understand that we may not be able to offer everything downtown, so if there are things that are offered up at the country club, I'd like for there to be real thought put into transportation, public transportation that's actually available and runs, runs regularly to get kids there, to get adults there. Um, it's important to me that we build a community center or a recreation center that seniors have access to, you know, whether it's walk, being able to walk there or being able to access it easily, um, you know, through public transportation. You know, I want our senior citizens to be able to age in place and not necessarily have to, you know, go somewhere else to do that. Thank you. Hi, Alan. Hi. My name is Ethan Atkin. Um, I'm answering the question, what are your expectations from a recreation and wellness center? And uh, in a very big picture way, what you would want is a indoor and outdoor facility that offered a variety of different recreation and wellness activities, both social as well as physical, uh, that would uh, be something that a family could go to, a three-generation family could go to, and everyone would find something that was of interest to them at that particular time that they went there. Uh, and uh, would have, you know, th this is an opportunity uh, in a situation like that for a municipality not to really introduce or try to tell people about well wellness, but to make sure that a place where a three-generation family is going has information and resources available to all three of those generations that address wellness, not just their recreation or physical needs, but your mental health needs, and your uh, your regular health needs. Uh, and um, th this is my idea of what an ideal place would would be like. And the beauty of something like that is for a, a community like Montpelier and Washington County in general is right now there is no such place. And it would attract people to come into the city. It would attract businesses. It would attract... Uh, because a lot of, if you go to Blue Cross Blue Shield, they are crying out all the time that we can't get employees to come and work for us here. They may move out of town if they can't figure out a way to attract people. This type of, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you can build a recreation and wellness center, this can be the kind of thing that would attract businesses and people to move into the area and because they know that this is there. It's a rural community at the end of the day. And we don't, it, it, people move out of rural communities because these types of uh, facilities don't exist. Montpelier has not grown in this population in 25 years. Why? Because we don't have these kinds of things. This is what we need. Thank you. Hi again, Alan. It's me, Nolan, again. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really loving this this dialogue so much. Um, so I just find it so awesome and interesting um, that um, some of us are making a point of 
um, of the perceived difference between recreation and wellness. Uh, so for me, I'd like to just specifically sort of reemphasize, you know, um, I do specifically think that um, a wholesome community does have to use this word wellness in our everyday vocabulary. I'm simply wondering um, if this word makes some of us uh, uncomfortable, perhaps because it suggests a clinical angle of inquiry. Is the word recreation more synonymous with a busybody, a World War II era industrial mentality? In this century, we speak of group meditation, daily group yoga, tranquility. So much of our emphasis for the kids is on these competitive sports. I'm interested in seeing those options for interacting with children and families like at our pool. We do have local gymnasiums. I do not go there and run on a treadmill or do spinning or lift weights. I find that kind of redundant. If you see my point, although the gymnasiums nowadays are really nice, they have a more of a cafe in there. Have you been up there? They have a community up there. There's even a substance recovery center day that's free and accessible. So that's where I'm I'm going in this year 2024 with a mental health pandemic, an obesity pandemic, trying to survive this COVID era. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Marna, if you're ready to go, you can go ahead and speak up and then we'll take more questions from the room. Okay, yes, I just want to say I find much of the discussion confusing in that as far as I understand, many of the examples included private facilities, private endeavors, or public education endeavors. I'm not sure what the intent here is. Is it a discussion for creating a regional center? Someone recently mentioned a public-private combination. I guess what I understood this to be was something by and for the taxpayers of Montpelier to consider a feasibility study for that audience. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it may be helpful to have a good definition to that. Thank you. Uh, you're going to speak to that or you want to leave that for another time? Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to it. It's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think our assignment is to frame the question that Marna just pointed out. Um, you know, what are, what are the options that are on the table and what makes the most sense. You know, Mont Montpelier is a very kind of active community where the citizens are very used to having a lot of input uh, and thoughts as to how to spend their money. And um, there are a lot of different ways to approach this. There are a lot of things on the table. One is redoing the existing uh, center. Um, you know, and there's been a study done of that, and that's a multi-million dollar project. Another is to build something completely new up on the country club property. Um, we've certainly talked to the hub group about their proposal. Um, and uh, we also, on our site visit, were... Um, a little surprised by how potentially usable the existing Elks facility is. You know, from the outside, it doesn't look like much. Um, but when you walk inside it, and I'm saying this from 
the perspective of a person who's been in, you know, a hundred recreation facilities around the country, maybe more than that. Uh, we were kind of surprised by how nice the interior of that building was and how it had been used for different things like child care and, you know, um, you know, various recreation facilities. Um, and so I think there are a lot of options on the table, and I'm not sure that we necessarily have to pick one alone. Uh, we don't have to say the only, we have to, you know, we don't have to pose, you know, either you do this or you do that. Um, and if you do one thing, you close off the future of the other thing. Um, there may be a, a possibility here of doing several things by more creatively reusing the things we have, like the Elks Club uh, property. And maybe that's us viewing it objectively from the outside. That's the advantage of coming in from the outside is to look at something and go, you know, this is actually pretty nice. And maybe with some minor innovation, we could make this look like something very attractive and that could serve one part of the market. Um, so I'm just trying to make sure we understand that it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing or the other. There might be multiple options available to us here. And one of those might be a, a public-private partnership, um, you know, for racket sports. Um, I think that's, this is Steve Whitaker again. Um, I think I'll expand the range of options here uh, because it feels like a racket. Uh, <laughs> The, we've just been through a community trauma, which has still got lingering division over a private developer wanting to put in a hotel, but he couldn't get insurance for his garage. So the city bonded 10 million for a garage and the whole thing eventually uh, fell, fell apart uh, through extended litigation. But it really divided the community into who wanted city funds and bonding capacity to go into what. Uh, we don't yet have a vision, a clear vision, or even a feasibility study for the Elks Club land. Uh, we don't know whether the railroad uh, intersection with Route 2 is going to preclude a certain amount of traffic up there. We don't know uh, how much of it is buildable for housing or what type of price point housing. So we don't really know what the market is if we're going to talk in market but that's a publicly owned we did invest three million dollars of public funds in it and if i were to live up there i sure wouldn't want to hear pickleball and tennis all the time unwillingly it, you know i have no control over that we have other options and i'll speak to the liquor warehouse down on green mountain drive uh it is in the flood zone it had a few feet of water on the first floor in the last flood, but it's tall enough to even have a second deck for running. And the state is looking for another place to store their liquor. So that could house tennis. We also have a lot of vacant parking lots with the state not reconvening its employees and parking lots that could house a, one of those inflatable uh, balloon tents for indoor tennis, uh, safe distance from those who are annoyed by the noise. Uh, so we, we currently are, so I think we need to examine a distributed model of recreation. Our pool is way out on Elm street, you know, and there's no need for, and, and I also want to support the comments by Phil Dodd and Steve Cease about our, I think we're about $200 million in deferred maintenance in our infrastructure, uh, in, uh, near term debt to get, uh, get caught up, uh, and the com the community, the proximity, it's totally inconsistent with our green self-righteous goals to be driving up to the country club to get our recreation in. So uh, until we know what kind of housing is going to be there or if housing is going to be there, if we decide to sell the property, uh, maybe we can sell it to the hub and they can do what they want with it. But in the meantime, I think we need to look at other options for racket sports 
and definitely consider a relationship to the high school facilities and to underutilized parking lots, which could be enclosed for winter uh, tennis, paddle sports. Um, also, we have a crisis going on. There, there's something really privileged and annoying to me that we've got 60 plus people outside and another 60 about to be ejected from the hotels. And we can't seem to get a plan or a high powered consultant to put, you know, to lead a discussion on that emergency while uh, this one is taking up so much bandwidth. Thanks. Thank you. So, Alan, uh, maybe we can move on to the next question. We've got time for probably one more. Sure. So I think this was the core one. And this is an extension of the question before, you know, uh, what uh, programs and services do we need? Uh, maybe we've touched on that enough with the discussion about tennis and racket sports. Um, and I think this is, does anybody have any comments to make on how they would be involved other than to participate in the sports? And I think we've also touched on this. Does anybody have anything they want to add to this? Um, or does anybody want to speak, they'll speak in favor of kind of decentralizing things or what they see as the advantages of centralizing versus decentralizing in terms of location? Alan, Steve Whitaker, I'll speak very briefly again on this topic okay. that we do have a facility that I'm not supportive of a congregate shelter spending million dollar, millions of dollars on converting the existing rec center. I think that that is fully functional and utilized and walking distance, bicycle distance, right on the bike path uh, from multiple directions. It's ideal for basketball. It could We could upfit the showers and put some ADA compliance in it. So basketball in one place, tennis in another, pool in another, uh, you know, frisbee golf, but another. I think that a distributed model works well to not uh, create an over uh, over organized. Uh, let's let's let these things evolve organically, uh, and it, in a least cost model. Um, thanks. Thank you, and I I just would like to. Uh, point out that there was a master plan done for the country club site, a very thorough master plan that kind of points out where housing might go and where other services on the property might go. The city did do that. Um, and we do have a copy of that report and we've been studying it very, very thorough. Yeah, Alan, I'd like to also point out that was the Whitenberg study that was presented, and it was specifically not adopted, despite what you're reading in the draft city plan. It was not adopted, and there was objection to even, even calling it an actionable plan. So it is not an adopted actionable plan. It's a concept. And she's going to cut it off because she doesn't like what I'm saying. Contrary to your comments, Steve, it's uh, about time um, and we're into final remarks. So I appreciate you jumping in on that. Um, Alan, did you want to kind of close the discussion and talk about, you know, what's next in terms of this process? Um, what comes next is that we're going to write a short report um, for the city on uh, what we observed um, and what our thoughts are about whether or not it would make sense to proceed with uh, some type of feasibility study. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're going to address what we saw when we visited. 
Uh, we're going to try to gauge what we've heard in these meetings, which I think have been very, very helpful. And uh, we're also going to point out a little bit about how, you know, you could um, either centralize things, which is, you know, there there is an issue of staffing from the recreation department. Uh, it, you know, their staffing is very limited and we want to make sure that they can manage and supervise and provide recreational services safely at all the locations they're charged with supervising. Uh, another issue that we'll address is what will be the cost of renovating the existing recreation center? A study was done on that versus, um, you know, renovating country club and then the possibilities of a, a public private partnership. Um, you know, one of the things we have to be careful of here is that we don't want to burden this idea with too many kind of decisions that just put us in a continuous loop where we don't make any progress. Uh, because if there's one thing we've heard pretty consistently from um, people in the uh, focus groups we've had and the interviews we conducted, it's that um, the community needs to do something to improve the way it delivers recreation services. At the same time, we need to be very cost conscious. And one of the things we do, you know, we're not just a consulting firm, we manage about, uh, you know, 30 plus facilities around the country. And it's really important to us that when a community invests money in a recreation facility, that it looks at the long-term maintenance of that facility. Uh, we don't want to have a big bond sale, uh, build something new, and then not have the money to maintain it properly. Because these facilities do take a lot of wear and tear, uh, they degrade, um, and they need to be constantly maintained and updated. So looking into the future um, and making sure that what we recommend is something that your community can, man can maintain is very important. And I think on a final note, uh, we'd like to say that um, whether we proceed with a you know, more defined feasibility study or not, Montpelier has a lot of really unique assets and features. And I think the main one is the fact that so many of you participated in this process and so many of you showed up to this meeting today. And that's very impressive because in a lot of communities we work in, the public leaves that all up to the city. They don't really get heavily involved. And um, that says a lot about your community that so many of you are so willing to spend your time um, coming to these meetings, and so many of you spend your time supporting the various activities in the community uh, in terms of recreational wellness. So we want to thank you for the op this opportunity and uh, to tell you that it, for us, it's been an enjoyable and enlightening process, and we hope we get to work with you further. So Ellen, we're gonna um Evelyn's gonna give a quick um summary of where to find the survey. So all these questions are available online to answer completely if you'd like to. Um and then we have two folks that do one has a comment and one has a question in the room that we're gonna take. Um and that'll be sort of the end of things here for today. Um I just wanna okay. say thank you very much for participating. Um and if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to either Evelyn or myself. Um and we'll continue with this process as we all right, great. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so mo the folks that are here right now, um, I'm happy to see to see that you all heard about this somehow. Um, but I wanted to show you two places where you can um, get updates on this and um, and complete the survey. So here we are on the city of Montpelier's website. So if you scroll down, this portal right here, the community engagement portal, if you click anywhere on this bar, this will take you to um, our community engagement portal. Um, and you'll see there's different projects. And so we have um, we have a variety of different things going on. So please explore those. But if you scroll down to the community services um, section, 
you'll see the Recreation and Wellness Center. So if you click on View Project, this has the um, a full explanation of like, what the project is, um, some of the history about how it came about. And um, we have a summary of the um, important dates. So as things, as the project progresses, if there are other dates um, that pop up for meetings, we'll pop those in there. And then you'll scroll down just a little bit further. You can watch uh, the recordings of all the, of all the uh, past meetings. And then right down at the bottom, you'll see we have the open survey. So then you just click on that. And um, it's, it says it takes approximately 11 minutes to complete, but it's not time. So you can take as long as you want or as quick as you want. Um, and then to the other place, I'll just go back to the website. Um, so again, scroll down past the popular links, this latest news carousel, this is where we put all the recent um, things that are happening. Um, and so I up update this um, throughout the day. So you'll see we have um, a few things that show up, but I have the recreation right here, pinned right here. So then you just click on that. And then this is also another area where you can access updates, view the information, um, take the survey, and um, see the public information recording. So just two different places, kind of two different methods for in involving. Um, and then the other um, important place on the website is uh, if you wanted to sign up for notifications, you would just go back to the homepage, scroll down. So it's called, the system we use is called Notify Me. And so if you click on that, um, I recently added a tutorial video that just describes how to sign up. So I would just encourage you to watch that first. It's only about four minutes long. And then uh, you can just put your email address right in there, hit sign in, and then you would click the icon for which um, updates you wanna receive. And so for this project, we're sending updates out through the city of Montpelier general updates list. Um, and then we also have um, one for the Country Club Road project, the DPW news and the police department. And then if you scroll down, you can see all of our committees also have notification buttons as, as well. How did you get to that? So this is on our website. So if you go to montpelier-vt.org, um, this is what the homepage looks like. You'll just scroll down and then you'll see different links and latest news is right here. Sign up. Where, where was yep, that? to sign up is just a little bit above. It's notify me in the popular oh, links. Yeah. Um, and I'll also link to that when I do Facebook posts or uh, Front Porch Forum posts. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to always include a hyperlink there. So if you see the post and you want to sign up, if you haven't yet, just go ahead and click right on that link and it'll take you right there. Uh, so that will do questions, but thank you so much, everybody else for coming. Alan, you're still with us, I assume. Yes. Hi, it's Nat Winthrop. Hi, uh, Nat. Hi. Uh, in terms of public-private partnerships, I understand that's something that Power Wellness uh, has different models for and have helped encourage and create these partnerships uh, maybe in a hundred different places around the country. Um, when we first heard from you, there was a big focus on the medical center. And you also said that you would be meeting with major employers like Blue Cross Blue Shield or National Life of Vermont. Have you been meeting with those groups? And is there any indication that they may uh, be interested in a public-private partnership? We um, haven't met with anyone since we've been there. Uh, we did meet with some representatives of the hospital, uh, but we didn't get into any detailed discussions about how the hospital would be involved. Um, and we didn't get into any detailed conversations with uh, the businesses in the area, how they would be involved. Um, Public-private partnerships are certainly an option to consider. Um, and what you know, your the hub's proposal in effect is a form of a public-private partnership where a private group operates something on, you know, land that's owned by a municipality. Um, and I think that's certainly something that could be explored in more detail in the future. 
I hope that answered your question. Uh, we we did not hear anything in our meetings that would suggest to us that that you know that people weren't interested or that that wouldn't be a possible solution. My comment was you kind of addressed it, but there are a lot of people here that have opinions and things on a lot of those questions. So you answered that. So I just think it's really important that people who are here and who are online that have their opinions do the link to the survey to get your thoughts across. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And I can't see the audience, so I don't know how many people are there, but it sounds like there are a lot of people there, which is uh, just great. It's terrific. Yes, uh, thank you, Alan. So I think with that, we're going to bring it to a close. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, stay tuned. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.